So there's an odd kind of paradox in the global health situation where some countries have bid farewell to the COVID-19 pandemic, some countries are still reeling from the after effects of it. And of course, the World Health Assembly was one opportunity for a large number of countries to bring their concerns on board and also to thrash out what is being called as a pandemic treaty. We discussed these issues previously during the executive board meeting of the World Health Organization. And today we're returning to Jyotsna Singh from the People's Health Movement, who was actually in Geneva attending all the events and the conferences. And she's going to give us an update on what's happening right now. Jyotsna, welcome. Thank you. So Jyotsna, the biggest issue it seems from our discussions which we've had over the last few weeks is that the funding of the World Health Organization and money matters, as you said it, are actually crucial right now. Why is that? Absolutely. So uh, the thing is, it is about an overall direction in which uh, the global health governance uh, is moving when it comes to talking about where the funding and the resources for uh, any initiative will come from. So I'll begin with the WHO itself. Right. So this is an organization which is a multilateral organization, which means that primarily uh, it is the governments which are part of it who form the organization. And um, other people have more of an observer uh, status, though they are allowed to speak uh, on the uh, on the floor of the assembly. Uh, but if a voting is concerned and other aspects are concerned, it is the governments who do it. However, what's happening uh, earlier, say till the 1980s, most of the money for running WHO used to come from the governments. So there was a particular, it, there's a ratio, there is like according to your population and your per capita income, your GDP, uh, some money is uh, earmark that you that every government is supposed to give this much of money to run the organization now this is called core funding uh, okay. and all the organize all the countries decide together along with the who secretariat uh, where will the money be spent um, so uh, it was in 1970s that there was this famous conference took place in Almaty, uh, uh, which is now in Kazakhstan, then in USSR, uh, which where it was decided that uh, the main focus in the world is going to be, uh, and with the leadership of WHO, it is going to be uh, primary health care. Okay. Because it is an estimate that if people uh, are able to bring their needs early on to the health system, then 80% of the uh, ailments can be taken care of. And then you go to the higher uh, forms of tertiary care or secondary care only after that. Um, however, so but all of this had to happen. Uh, but then we started to see that uh, the WHO's funding uh, direction shifted. So it started to shift to donors, which uh, became majorly the flesh through capitalist organizations. Say the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has emerged over the years. And today, when we talk about as much as 83% of WHO's funding comes from these donors. Okay. And uh, what is the problem? They come with a very project-based mentality. Uh, they decide where the WHO will spend the money. And they, uh, it is rather than, than questioning uh, the structural uh, problems, um, uh, they would spend on vertical programs. So I am spending the money only on HIV program or only on polio. Now, whether it actually strengthens the uh, uh, prime, uh, public health system or not, that is really not their worry in that sense. You can see those words in the documents, but what we see happening on the ground is something very different. In fact, uh, this uh, this time when I was in Geneva, a friend I was talking to and she said um, that in South Africa, and this is her real life experience, uh, so uh, a pen was needed in another room. Uh, okay. but And it was present in one of the rooms, in one of the wards in the same health facility. But it could not be given because it had come under the head of uh, the HIV AIDS program. A simple so, pen to write with. Yes. So, so you start to decide things so minutely. And so the understanding is not comprehensive care at all. And and it all happens. So, so we do need, I mean, it is not to say that we did not need these programs to happen, but to divorce them from uh, the strengthening of the health systems becomes a problem. And uh, with donors, uh, the point is that they are very specific about the outcomes. So they are giving money for something very specific and they want very specific outcomes within a very narrow uh, 
uh, schema of things. Um, so this is what is happening in, since, since 90s. So now uh, the problem is that WHO actually has very less autonomy in deciding what it would like to do. All right. And, uh, the, and when I say WHO, I actually mean the WHO Secretariat and the countries together because right. they decide. And that is why the World Health Assemblies are important. Uh, but then it is all happening at the back door, etc., etc. So this year what happened, uh, there was a sustainable financing report which was uh, put forth for discussion by the WHO Secretariat, the Director General. And um, uh, it, it, it took two years for a committee to arrive at it. Okay. Uh, now, the committee itself correctly said that so much of funding, uh, earmarked funding coming, which is for a specific purposes, not giving uh, flexibility to WHO is a problem. Correct analysis, <laughs> but when we saw the recommendation this time, uh, it said that earmarked funding is one form of funding that WHO will take. It is really dangerous. It is dangerous, more dangerous than before, uh, because earlier there was this entire move to recognize the problem, but now it is institutionalizing earmarked funding. Now the countries, especially the rich countries, who some of them, something like US, who favor earmarked funding, they will take back to their parliament and say, now WHO approves of earmarked funding and that's what we are going to give. That's what Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will give. Because right. US as a country also gives a lot of earmarked funding. So, uh, so, so that has become the problem. And therefore, a lot of organizations, especially four organizations, uh, did a press conference uh, uh, there in Geneva, uh, People's Health Movement, uh, Society for International Development, Third World Network, and uh, Public Services International. Uh, all of them came together because they recognized this is going to be a disaster for WHO. Um, so, 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 so Jyotsna, uh, are there countries which are actually attempting to change the direction which the WHO seems to be headed in? And how have what are the crucial issues on which there are differences between the developed world and the poorer countries? What, what are the core issues here? Uh, so, uh, there was uh, a story which was uh, um, which uh, uh, Geneva Health Files broke right during the WHA and it showed that it was the US, the US government which pressurized WHO to bring in earmarked funding. They said we will not let it pass, the report pass unless you have it. Okay. So yes, this is where the developed world stands, right? And uh, uh, in our conversations and I will not name the country because they have asked us not to name them, but uh, a, 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 a known representative from an African nation told us that they were not in favor of earmarked funding. They actually tried to push for uh, flexible funding because they say that it is the poorer nations who suffer more because uh, the issues of the poorer nations, say Ebola in Africa, right. it should be one of the priorities to work on. Um, we do not get to work on it. And um, uh, issues like intellectual property, etc., which have harmed Ebola treatment reaching uh, 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 African nations, all of that has happened. So, but he was very clear that uh, th these problems exist and we are not, uh, uh, even though we push for uh, uh, earmark, uh, not having earmarked funding and flexible funding so that we have an equal say because WHO otherwise works on one country, one vote principle. Absolutely. Um, uh, but then, so what is happening is that uh, those very principles on which WHO was formed uh, in, uh, nine, in the 1950s are being questioned and it is serious, WHO should also take it very seriously. So, you know, when we hear a phrase like the pandemic treaty, it sounds like the WHO, the member uh, countries are actually moving towards solving a very big problem. I mean, the world was reeling under COVID and it was a very difficult time. Is that really the case? No, <laughs> doesn't. Uh, so, I mean, whether it will happen or not is a different question, whether it will Okay. It is going in the direction of solving a problem or not is a different question altogether. Uh, so pandemic accord, as it is called, is being discussed. And again, coming back to the funding part of it, yes. again, the way we are saying the overall direction is uh, something which is uh, becoming a problem because the financial mechanism, um, so there is a pandemic fund that the G20 countries, not at the WHO, but the group of 20, uh, they have formed, which again consists of most of the uh, developed countries and some developing countries like India uh, and all. Um, so, uh, which is actually uh, based out of World Bank. So, this is the uh, fund where countries will put the money and they will see how to go about things in future. Uh, 
uh, which is such a problem and it is giving a lot of anxiety to uh, continents like Africa, I will come back to it again and some of the Latin American countries because they are not in favor of something of this sort because uh, th th what they are saying is and I think this is going to become one of the points on which some of the developing countries at least or the developing countries blocks mm -hmm. are not going to agree and I hope not easily and I hope they will not agree at all not easily for sure they won't uh, which is um, uh, that you should have a fund of course we need to create a pool of funds for pandemic and it is not uh, only during the pandemics this fund will be used but also to see how to avoid pandemics and if it happens how to have equitable distribution of uh, vaccines medicines and other the response forms. As the they response say. as they say exactly uh, there should not be travel bans put uh, arbitrarily and all of that so all of that but then the money will uh, sh should be able to come from this one they they are saying that we can have uh, it, it should be the who which ac actually decides how much fun and how to use it and even if World Bank because it has um, as they say experience in using it so these countries uh, some of the South global south countries are saying um, but the decisions of how to use the fund has to come from the World Health Assembly kind of a, uh, 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 a, grouping. A, a grouping and it cannot be a few countries deciding about it and they also say that it is not enough to have a few nations decide where there is one representation of one country uh, in that group because the developed countries then overpower them absolutely so it has to be everyone's say uh, when it comes to decide what will be the fund used for and how will the distribution happen so that is one part right yeah and if i can come there are there is another thing on which um, i know at least the african countries are going to really put their foot down that they will not accept uh, which is access and benefit sharing now abs in short right. uh, which it is called which basically means that if uh, companies and it's mostly companies private companies uh, they make use of uh, a pathogen that has arisen from a particular uh, country and have uh, made uh, treatments or vaccines using that then everybody should have access to the benefit also so the access not only to the pathogens okay. uh, say the virus or the bacteria but also access to the products that come out of using them because mm -hmm. some country has actually uh, shared the uh, genetic sequencing and etc using that but right. then they don't get access to the cures or the remedies no no we, we saw it in a case of south africa south africa was the first one uh, who said about omicron and they actually shared the genetic uh, genetic sequencing but what did south africa get a travel ban though the same uh, virus during covid was present in many countries but Western countries did not face the travel ban. It was such an unequal travel ban that the countries of the global south faced. And instead of uh, saying that, uh, okay, it is good, this is what South Africa has done, and then the vaccines that now come, which will save people from Omicron, should reach South Africa and other countries. That did not happen. And we have seen this in so many cases. We have seen this in Ebola. We have seen this uh, when Indonesia shared a, a particular sequencing, and Indonesia is not the one which got it. In fact, Ebola, that is what there was this report by MSF they also launched it during the World Health Assembly uh, it clearly shows that uh, so in 2020 two Ebola treatments were uh, approved by the US FDA um, and we have had outbreaks of Ebola in African nations over yes. the past two years right yes. we all know that African nations do not have access to those treatments all the treatments all the treatments are being hoarded by the US because US the government has bought it they bought think them. that if people in their country fall sick, then they should get to access those medicines. This is what pandemic preparedness and response that is happening. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so, and people are saying that the accord that we want should go absolutely opposite to this. Right. But the WHO already is supposed to have or has a system to deal with health emergencies. And you earlier told me that the pandemic treaty or the pandemic accord and the IHR are proceeding in parallel. Are they replicating the process? Are they wasting hard-earned funds? What, what is going on there? 
so yeah uh, so there are two things yes uh, initially when the pandemic accord was being discussed and eu was the one which was pushing for it from the beginning and by the way that started uh, even when the covid was we were in the middle of covid right. in 2021 that's right uh, right and um, that's when they started to discuss about the future pandemic um, of course then that, that's where also the inequality comes because uh the developing world was reeling under covid worse even that time uh, but well so uh, this uh, civil society organizations and activists said even that time that when we are talking about amending the international health regulations which uh, got kicked in in 2005 after the sars um, uh, right. uh, covid that uh, sars virus uh, spread that happened um so but then there was a lot of push and now we are in a situation where we have two accords being discussed okay so uh, uh, this is uh, where we are but um, so the thing is again now the problem is uh, the v- the developed countries have more resources you always see more delegates for the uh, from these countries coming in so they dev- uh, talk about two things together all the time they have uh, but with developing countries it becomes difficult to really negotiate on so many uh, fronts at the same time so that is one but again as i'm saying that is happening um, so uh, uh, on ihr there is a, in some of some countries a little less focus there is more focus on pandemic treaty because that has become the famous uh, that's right uh, the word now because of covid uh, but yes so both are going on and um, uh, it similar issues are coming up in both because they are quite similar processes uh, whether the intellectual property barriers will be addressed or not whether access and benefit sharing will happen or not uh, and um, how how will we manage the funds so th- these issues are coming up in both what we have heard is uh, that uh, the developing countries are saying uh, there is a possibility because next year 77th who is the one where uh, the pandemic accord is supposed to be finalized uh, but they are saying that what we will say is that we, we cannot decide one of them first and then leave the second uh, of them to happen later so if pandemic accord is is being discussed uh, then ihr amendments have to be finalized in the same assembly or the other way around because they are saying if they are able to discuss properly in one and get some ben- i mean push for their demands and if they are accepted all right th- they are not confident in the second one that will happen all and right. if it doesn't happen then they will be at the losing end all right so, so the, either both right. or none all right so and uh, uh, but again the point is that this is what they are uh, aiming for and hopefully it will happen in that fashion so i sort of glean two things from what you say that the developing world is actually hoping to get what it needs just because the developed countries the wealthy countries are getting what they want uh, you know that's sort of a sad situation but the other thing i sort of understand from what you say is that it is the poorer countries which are more progressive would that be a correct estimate i think it would be yes because uh, as i said that when you talk to the de- delegates from say namibia botswana or the afro block block as a whole okay. uh, you do here because you do you see what happened with africa during covid like it was the continent which suffered the most and now you have mrna hub coming up in south africa but it is just too little too late the mrna hub would be for the vaccine for the right? vaccines yes and uh, there was a lot of push that we should have this facility in africa uh, and throughout covid it didn't happen and now uh, the, uh, this is happening so uh, hopefully i mean it is it's that's what i'm saying too little too late because maybe some of the new vaccines south africa will be able to produce but not for the pandemic when it was needed the most so so right. and uh, africa just none of the countries could achieve a very good level of vaccination so of course their experience and what uh, they are uh, taking very progressive positions because they know their continent can't go through something similar uh, again uh, then we are also seeing good positions coming from some of the latin american countries and that is because of the change in political dynamics there we have more progressive governments and now with lula becoming uh, 
uh, Brazil's premier again, and uh, Brazil's famous slogan now is "Brazil is back," and uh, science so, is back, and a lot, a lot of things. So yes. you do hear the the slogan in even in these meetings. So at WHO right. we heard that, uh, and Brazil has actually uh, so uh, so Brazilian uh, statements. If you see there, they do take positions which are more progressive and about access and benefit sharing. Uh, IP barriers should be removed. They do say that they actually brought. Uh, uh, a resolution which is health for indigenous people so brazil now ha does not have only a health ministry they have a, a, a vice minister for health for indigenous people so who would focus on that and they were present uh, very actively advocating for indigenous people's rights uh, in the assembly they did that and in, we had interviewed him for people's dispatch and uh, he very clearly said that we want to use the word indigenous people because it has connotations of colonization and it is not just about any community it is about community which uh, communities which got uh, discriminated against or displaced in massive numbers because of the coming of the colonizers right. so it is actually uh, we are fighting back the colonization so that was good so brazil is doing these things and of course it is easy to talk to them for the civil society and uh, colombia is another country which takes uh, chile as well so we are seeing some of those countries because of their political this thing so yeah so we are hoping that next year when the pandemic accord actually becomes the thing to talk about uh, we will have these progressive positions come out and they do not compromise <laughs> because otherwise we won't be able to deal with a, yet another pandemic. Hopefully, it doesn't happen. Right. Um, and it is not only about a pandemic. It is also about uh, how do you ensure uh, uh, it does not happen. It also gets related to many other health emergencies because IHR is not only about pandemic. Uh, the, right. uh, it also responds to something like what happened in Turkey. An earthquake. Uh, and uh, the, the earthquake, uh, floods in Pakistan, Ebola. Absolutely. So it kicks in for all those things. So we do need a strong IHR. There right. is no doubt about it. Now, so, Jyotsna, yes. the IHR, like the pandemic accord, would work only if the uh, intellectual property rights are relaxed. Is Would that be a correct estimate? That's essential to make Well, everything <laughs> will work only then. So, because whether you talk What's about... What's the likelihood of that's happening? I think those are very uh, different discussions, uh, should not be. Uh, as I said, that we would like to see uh, health as, treated as a comprehensive thing and not one by one. So whether we talk about non-communicable diseases, uh, we have been talking about infectious diseases, but non-communicable diseases also. The, the kind of, uh, I mean, you see, and and then I guess you're right. This gets reflected in WHO's documents also. Um, so if you do not have medicines, say for cancers, cancer right. medicines are just so costly. Uh, the medicines for rare diseases are so costly. Now, if WHO wants to put in those uh, recommendations in its documents, which would say that, you know, uh, everyone should have access to these medicines and all, uh, and put forth p proper uh, p policy guidelines, right? it is difficult to do if your medicines are so costly. Absolutely. And intellectual property is the barrier. The problem is, it is not only WHO, but the TRIPS agreement, which actually decides these things, which is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property, that is actually hosted in the World Trade Organization, which works very differently than the, uh, than the WHO. Absolutely. Uh, it is a very closed body, and it is largely it the amount of influence uh, uh transnational corporations and have uh who also has but much less compared to how wto works um, so um so we would like who to sort of take more progressive positions and see to it that it does pressurize wto uh, to behave better when it comes to health it is about lives at the end of the day Right, so, Jyotsna. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us with that. And as you heard Jyotsna just tell us, it's a big fight for the developing countries to get access to basic healthcare and in fact to push the WHO towards a more progressive public health oriented system for healthcare. Thanks very much for watching us.